Hello, friends. Welcome to Chickenlandia and welcome to Bok Talk, your 100% friendly backyard chickens show. Hold on, I gotta mute something. Okay. Can you still hear me? <laughs> I, think you, I think you can. Yeah, you can still hear me. Oh, thank you so much for being here today. I am the president of Chickenlandia, and I am a backyard chicken educator up here in the Pacific Northwest. Today, I'm going to be answering some commonly asked chicken questions. I have a few listener questions that I'm going to go over, and then I'm going to open up the chat for questions. I just, you know, I was trying to think of like a topic for today. And I decided I'm just going to make it kind of informal today. I will be really honest and say that the last two couple weeks in Chickenlandia have been very difficult. And I'm not going to go into detail about it today. Um, I, I'm i pretty sure I'm going to make a video about it. Um, and that will come out not, will probably come out because I made chicken out. <laughs> <laughs> it'll probably come out not this week but next week okay and you know i'm okay everyone's okay but it's just been it's been a heck of a time over here um so anyway i just wanted to let you guys know that is going on if you want to submit a question to bok talk all you have to do is go to welcome to chickenlandia.com go to the contact section and click ask a chicken question. And while you are there, you will definitely want to join my mailing list. It is called Chickenlandia Nation, and it is the coolest chicken mailing list in this universe and all the multiverses. <laughs> uh, and I don't spam. I do not spam. I don't like send. First of all, I don't have time to send out like all kinds of emails every week. Um, I just send out the important stuff. I don't like being spam, so I don't do it to other people. Um, but you will get a coupon when you sign up for my online course, which is called Chickenlandia's Backyard Chickens 101, a chicken course for everyone. And that is a fun, interactive online course. Um, you get access, you know, quick access to me, quick access to the Chickenlandia Presidential Advisor, uh, who is also an instructor on the course. So I hope to see you guys there. All right, I'm gonna say hi to some people that are here. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of people here. Uh, Val of Coop de Chickenville, I like your new name. <laughs> Fluffy Silkies is here. The the Yawordle. <laughs> I think I'm saying that right. Chris Clark. Diane. I'm sorry, I'm not going to say your last name because I'm going to mess it up. Uh, Eddie Abernathy is here. Cadence is here. Oh, congratulations, Cadence. She had a Sarama chick hatch today. Joey is there. Peace of my heart homestead. I love that name. Um, Benny, Benny Heim. I hope I'm saying that right. You're here. Thank you for being here. Roger Stewart, Stewart, shortcake 39553 says, hello, you're getting it. <laughs> Bean and Briar is here. Deb Kincaid. Oh, so many people here. Thank you guys so much for being here. Okay, so f before I start answering all the chicken questions, <laughs> as many as I can get in today, I need to make two announcements because you guys know I got to pay my chicken bills. My chickens are not paying. I keep asking them, can you pay my bills? <laughs> and they say no. They will not pay my bills. So I have to make these announcements. So here we go. Um. As always, I want to let you know that this podcast was brought to you by the folks at My Favorite Chicken. My Favorite Chicken is my favorite online shop to get my feed. They have scratch and peck feed, which is non-GMO, organic, socially responsible feed. Love them. Supplies, fun chicken stuff like aprons and purses and stuff like that. Um fun chicken treats so there's one called chicken fun do i love that one <laughs> that is myfavoritechicken.com and i will put a link to them 
in the show notes and in the description. This podcast was also brought to you by Small Pet Select. Small Pet Select is a small local company to me and they have an online store that I love and I want to share it with you. Uh, right now I'm using three of their products and I just got another one that I'm going to try. Um, but the three that I'm using right now is the organic shavings, which I really like. Um, their pet greens, which is like um, sprouts that you can grow in a bag really easily and they're super fun. And, you know, you can feed them to your chickens. Um, and then also they have flaked oyster shell, which my chickens really like. And I just got a new kind of oyster shell that they sent to me. So I'm going to be trying that very, very soon. But anyway, um, great people, really nice, kind people. I love working with them. Um, I'm going to leave a link to them in the description and in the show notes. And there is a, a little coupon code for you. Um, and they also have stuff for like chinchillas and, and <laughs> other fuzzy, furry creatures if you're, if you've got them. Um, okay. So, uh, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, Julie. All right. Um, so before we get into the submitted questions, I'm going to do kind of a rapid fire, uh, answering of like super common questions that I get. I just get them all the time. So I'm just going to answer a few of those. Um, but I did want to mention something very, very important. As soon as I turn the page. Today is the birthday of Top Chickenlandia fan Riley. She is turning 11 years old old. So I wanted to give her a big happy birthday from the president of Chickenlandia. Thank you so much for being a super fan and I hope you're having an awesome day. And let me give you a little uh, party noise. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you guys heard that. It's the first time I've done that. <laughs> okay, so here are here's my rapid fire answering of the most common questions I get. Um, the first question I always get is, what kind of chickens should I get? So when people are starting out, they're like, I, there's like so many breeds and they're all beautiful and they don't know what breeds to get. So, um, you know, what I always say is it depends on why you're getting chickens. Like if you, if you're getting chickens cause you want eggs, then you, you should get some layers. If you are getting chickens because you want fun pets, then you may want to look into getting bantams. And if you want a little bit of both, which I fully, fully support in that decision, <laughs> then you could get both. Um, usually the, the layers that you see the most at the farm stores and the biggest sellers from the hatcheries, they're going to be, you know, the, just really the easiest breeds. Now you want to make sure that the breeds that you get are good for the climate that you're in. Cause not, not all breeds are the same. There are some that are more heat hardy and some that are more cold hardy. Uh, generally, if you go to your local farm store and you look at the, the, you know, the popular layer breeds that they have there, they're probably going to be good for your climate, but just make sure and do your research and double check that they're okay for your climate. Um, and you know, certainly if you're getting bantams, a lot of those, you know, sometimes they will need supplemental heat or something, uh, if they're like super fancy chickens or special need chickens or not cold hardy chickens. So just make sure that you do your research in that regard. Um, I do have a video where I talk about like my top four breeds and I certainly talk about it in the course. Um, I will link that video in the description and in the show notes. So the second question I get is how, you know, once people find out what they want to get, they say, well, how many should I get? Or sometimes they say, how many can I get away with? <laughs> because, because there's so many fun breeds, they want to get more. Um, so generally I recommend, unless there's a law restricting this in your area. I would go with the, the minimum, the minimum number that I would go with would be four chickens. And this is because 
it's because of the chickens nature they are flock animals they do the best when you know they can live out their flock dynamics daily and also it's because of the pecking order now um you know if you let's say you get two chickens and one dies then you have a single chicken and you will need to integrate more chickens it's better usually to integrate more than one so that is going to be a more stressful experience if you're just starting out getting chickens so of course there is a way to integrate them and it's you know it's not it's not too bad but for beginners, I would say try to avoid that within their, within you know your first six months of having chickens, and instead start out with four. So even if you lose one or even two, you don't have this situation where you're left with a single chicken. Okay, um, so I I think to be safe, start as as small as you can as well. So a minimum of four and then uh, leave yourself room to grow. So if you're like a family that where everybody eats eggs, like you eat a lot of eggs, you know you eat a lot of eggs, then I would get a chicken for every family member. Um, but I would, I would probably stop there, unless you're the type of person, like there's just some people that, you know, they just get really prepared, they do a ton of research, and they're able to handle it, like they'll get, they'll start out with 12 chickens, um, and they're able to handle that. But if you're, you know, maybe someone like me, you know, I started out with 10 and I was supposed to start with like six. <laughs> and originally I was like, oh, I'm just going to get four. Um, you know, I was a little bit stressed out when I first started. So I, I just think it's better to start out small and then give yourself room to grow. Um, okay, the next question, how much room do chickens need? Two to four square feet of space within the coop per standard size chicken. Now, it's better to have more room, of course. So I would lean towards four square feet of, of space. But you can get away with two square feet of space per chicken if your chickens have other areas where they can get out of the elements outside of their coop. So if their main shelter is their coop, and that's really the only place where they could go to get out of the elements, like completely out of the elements, then you're going to want to have four square feet of space in there. Because, you know, even here, we don't have that much snow, but last year we had about, gosh, there was snow on the ground for about at least a week, maybe two weeks. And I know some of you are laughing because you're like, oh, we have snow in the ground from October, you know, from November until June. Yeah. But here that's very, that's not common. Um, it, it just doesn't happen. So, but you know, during that whole time, my chickens were in their coop, mainly in their coop and mainly in their little run. So I need to make sure that they're not going to get too, you know, super bored during that kind of situation because when chickens are bored, that's when they get into trouble. And we don't want that. Okay, so two to four square feet of space, depending on what they have outside of their coop. And that's for their coop. And then in the run, I would go with at least 10 square feet of space per standard size chicken in the run. Okay? And I, I'm just going to mention this. The most asked question that I get, that I have gotten for many, many years is, can hens lay eggs without a rooster? And the answer is yes, they can. <laughs> they just won't be fertilized. <laughs> if you want baby chicks, you got to have a rooster. All right. Okay, I'm going to answer a few uh, submitted questions. Um, these were submitted through my website, welcome to chickenlandia.com. And then we will hit the chat and answer some uh, questions from the chat after I'm done with these. Uh, the first question is from Kristen. I hope I am saying your name right. Um, uh, she says that recently one of my chickens suddenly died, and I wanted to know if you had any insight. We went away for the weekend, and I was worried about them being outside due to the recent extreme heat. So I set them up in my basement with food, water, uh, and nesting boxes. A pet sitter came and checked on them daily. You did great. You did great. Um, right when we got home, one of our girls, a Rhode Island Red, was unsteady. Her head kept falling to one side. 
and she died within 10 minutes of us being home. We have a feeling she was old. We adopted her a year ago, so we had no idea her age. Um, sorry. She also just looked old and, and always has since we got her. Is it possible that the stress of being moved inside for the weekend killed her? All of our other girls seem fine. Thank you for all you do for chickens. You are so welcome. You're so welcome. Um, so I, I get the, I get this a lot. Um, I get messages from people who their chicken has died suddenly and they want, and they want to know why. Understandably, they want to know why. And specifically, they want to know what they did that made their chicken die. And I will say that most of the time, it is nothing that they did. So I don't think this doesn't sound like anything that you did. These chickens were, they were in your house. Like they're obviously very well cared for. Um, laying breeds are just, you know, a Rhode Island red that's likely from a hatchery, a, a, a very high production breed. And they're just not bred for longevity. They really are not. They are bred to lay a lot of eggs, like within the first couple of years of life. Um, and because of that, they have very high nutritional, um, requirements and they really just don't have a lot of resilience in terms of like how long that they can live. Um, so I just, I feel like it really doesn't sound like anything that you did. It's likely that it was just, she, you know, like you said, she may have been old. Um, it may have been some other situation that was out of your control. There is something that happens called sudden chicken death and people blame themselves for it. I mean, I did a whole podcast about it and I will leave that in the description and in the show notes for you. But that's another one that um, I don't think, you know, it's usually not anything that you've done. So my opinion is it was nothing that you did. And that chicken was so lucky, so lucky to be cared for by you. So thank you for doing that. Um, and I hope that makes you feel better. Sorry, my throat is getting so dry. Okay, the next me the next uh, question is from Julissa. What can I give a chicken that has bubbles coming out of its nose? She's about two months and has been sneezing and has most of the symptoms of mycoplasma galliceptacum, uh, and that's like a um, a um, bacterial um, respiratory disease. Uh, and another chicken, so, uh, and another chicken that she can't be apart from is also sick. Oh, I'm sorry. We truly don't want any of them to die. So, um, Jalissa, I'm so sorry that you're dealing with this. That, that's really hard. I've dealt with stuff like that before. Um, and respiratory issues are just like, it, you can just really feel like, um, just really kind of out of control. Just like, uh, I can't, I can't control the situation. What am I going to do? Um, like I said, uh, mycoplasma galliceptacum is a, it's a bacterial respiratory disease. It is a chronic disease. Um, and it can get pretty serious. Um, but it's, it's not necessarily a death sentence. Um, there are chickens that can live with it, but they have, you know, they have this chronic disease and they can be infectious during that time. Um, it would be best if you could consult with a licensed veterinarian on this. And I think you said, you know, I have to cut the, the questions down. I have to edit the questions down a little bit just for, you know, for time's sake. Um, but I think that you said that you didn't have a veterinarian that you could consult in that, in your area. And also like a lot of people just can't afford to do that. Um, so I would say if you think that it might be mycoplasma, I would, uh, get something like, um, an oregano supplement. Um, there, I think Dervet has one. It's like a, an oregano supplement. There's more than one on the market right now in the United States. I'm not sure where you're, where you are. Um, if you can get a hold of one of those, I would treat your whole flock with the oregano supplement. 
Um, and you can also give them colloidal silver. So I would choose one or the other, but you can do like a tablespoon per gallon of colloidal silver and you can give that to your flock and it acts like a antibiotic. I mean, it's not, it's not going to be as, um, uh, what do you, what, it, it, in my experience, um, the results may vary. <laughs> um, but certainly what it can do is boost the immunity of the other chickens that haven't gotten sick and it can keep them from, uh, from getting sick, hopefully. So I would do that. There is a, a, um, podcast that I did and it was called, uh, dealing with respiratory issues in chickens. That is uh, from season one, it's episode 17, and I will link that in the description and in the show notes for you. And I talk about a kind of a um, respiratory protocol that you can do, and basically I'll just tell you really quick, um, but if you want you know, more details, I would go listen to that podcast. But basically you start out with, you know, always in Chickenlandia, we, we do the rest method when we have a sick that a sick chicken, unless, unless they have something that's, you know, requires very specific care. I would do the rest method, which is, and I will put a, a link to a video about that in the description and in the show notes as well. But, uh, rest is an acronym. So the R stands for remove your chicken from the flock. The E stands for electrolytes, vitamins, probiotics. So you want to give your chicken some electrolytes, vitamins, and probiotics, and you can get that. You know, you there's recipes online if you don't want to buy anything. Um, just find a recipe for chickens for electrolytes, and um, but otherwise you can find it like online or on at the at the farm store. Um, the S is for scrambled eggs. That is the ultimate chicken comfort food, and you really want to just get their strength up and hopefully entice them to eat something so that they can um, be stronger so they can get better. And the T stands for temperature control. So you wouldn't, you know, if it's really cold outside, you wouldn't want to leave a sick chicken outside in the cold. Cause then they're, they have to, their bodies have to like work really hard to stay warm. And you don't want that. You don't want them to also have to be working to stay cool if it's hot outside. So I would bring them into somewhere where it's temperature control, like your garage or maybe in your house. Um, so I would start there. And then I'll, I will add um, garlic either to their feed or to their water. And I'll do just like a, a cut up clove of garlic per gallon of water. And I'll do that for the whole flock and also for the chicken that is isolated and sick. Um, you can also like mince up a clove of garlic and like, um, scramble it with, you know, put it in some scrambled eggs. Um, if you don't want to put it in their water. Uh, and I do use essential oils. I don't put them on my chickens unless it's in some kind of very diluted, uh, formula and I don't put them in my chickens, but I will put them um, I will diffuse them, not in a, in like a, a water diffuser, but I'll put, I basically I'll get a couple paper towels and I'll put a few drops of some clearing essential oils on one of the, on both of the paper towels. I'll put one in the coop and I'll put one with the sick chicken. I'll just like hang it up near them. Um, and uh, oils like lavender, eucalyptus, um, tea tree, mint, peppermint, uh, lemon, and thyme. Those are all really good ones. So you can do a combination of those or do whichever one you have on hand and just hang it in the coop. Hold on. Oh gosh. <coughs> Telling you my throat's dry. I'm sorry, Bean and Briar, but she gave her chickens cabbage and they didn't eat any of it. They usually will if you give them time. Um, so yeah, I, I will hang one, I'll hang one up in the coop and I will hang one near my sick chicken and that will hopefully just kind of keep, encourage, uh, their sinuses to stay clear. Um, and then I'll add a, a, a pretty generous sprinkling of oregano and thyme. Those are my two favorite herbs for chickens. 
Um, I'll put it in their feed or I'll put it um, in some scrambled eggs and have them eat that. Just give them that little extra boost to hopefully uh, keep them from getting sick. And then, you know, there's some optional things that you can do. I, I really like uh, Rescue Remedy, which is a flower essence um, by a company called Bach. And um, you can get it at, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it at a health food store, you can get it at like Petco or PetSmart. Um, I'll put a couple of drops of, of that in the phlox water and in the sick chicken's water. And there are some homeopathic remedies I might consider. And I, I will link a, um, a blog that I wrote about homeopathics for chickens in the description and in the show notes for you. Okay, hold on. Is that it? All right, one more question and then I am going to open up the chat. So this question is from Skip. Skip says, hi, I love your videos. Thank you. Uh, my wife and I are new chicken keepers. Unfortunately, one of our hens is starting to look and sound a lot like a rooster. <laughs> Do you have any resources, list of farms that might be interested in roosters or any advice at all? Thank you. So this is very common, a very common question that I get. Um, I'm sorry that happened. I, I, I really wish uh, we could change our, um, you know, our attitude about roosters in this country. I really feel like the sound of the rooster needs to be something that we get used to hearing more in all neighborhoods across the country. I really do believe that. Um, it's the, to me, that's, it's the sound of a sustainable future. And I think, you know, if we are interested in sustainability and, you know, making the world a better place for our kids, we're going to have to kind of make some, uh, compromises. So, and get used to that sound, which is a beautiful sound, I think. Um, especially when you compare it to like a, other city sounds, like construction, you know. <laughs> it's like, why, why is the sound of a rooster so bad? Um, but anyway, that's neither here nor there right now because there's a lot of places where you, people can't have roosters. So it's a genuine dilemma. Um, and, you know, uh, one of the important things to know when you're getting baby chicks, if you're getting them from a hatchery or if you're getting them from a farm store, even if they have been sexed, which means they've been uh, divided by pullet and cockerel, um, you know, even if you get pullets, there is a chance you could get a rooster. The, 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 you know, it's not foolproof. That process is not foolproof. So it's super important for you to have a, have a plan before you get your chickens. Um, of course, I, I'm saying this and I know 2020, you know, like hindsight is 2020. Okay. I totally get that. Um, but I, I want to mention that for those of you that haven't gotten chickens yet, like it's important for you to know that, that you need to have a plan in case you get a rooster because roosters happen. They do happen. Um, if you have a situation where you have a rooster and you need to rehome him, I think um, if you got them from a breeder or from a farm store, I would contact them first and find out if they have any resources for you. Now, I know a lot of people get upset. Like they're like, you know, I, I got chicks from the farm store and there was a rooster. And so they're, they're upset. They're upset at the farm store or they're upset, upset at the staff. But the, they don't sex the roosters at the store. I mean, sex the, the chickens at the store. They don't do that. They arrive from the hatchery sexed. And that process of sexing, sexing the chickens. <laughs> I'm going to get demonetized here. <laughs> that process uh, is not foolproof, like I said before. And so it's really not anyone's fault. Like when it happens, it's 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 really unfortunate. But I would... I would tell you, you know, don't, don't go in, uh, being upset at them because it's really, it's not their fault. It's just something that happens. Um, so I would find out if they have any resources for you. And a, another thing that you can do is there are a lot of online local chicken clubs. So especially on Facebook, um, there might be a chicken community. I would, I would just do a search on Facebook and see, if there is a, a, a community that you can join, um, just be extra careful. Like if you, 
if you post a rooster and say, you know, I'm looking to rehome this rooster, and you sometimes you have to be really careful because of Facebook's rules, um, but there are ways to get around that. But, um, you know, you need to really vet that person because they might want to eat your rooster. And if that's something that you don't want, you have to like really say that up front because a lot of people will take in roosters and they, they will eat that rooster. Okay. So if that, if you don't want that, you need to say that up front and make sure that they understand that. Um, the other thing that's really important for you to do, and especially if you're going through something like Craigslist or some other kind of classified, um, classifieds, um, you need to be very careful because cockfighting still happens in the United States. Um, it's very unfortunate, but it does happen. And some people will get roosters and use them as bait and, you know, in training or whatever. So, um, what I would say is you drop your chicken off at their place. Don't have them come and get it. And if you don't like what you see, uh, you won't regret leaving, but you might regret, you know, leaving with your chicken and not leaving it there, <laughs> but you might regret leaving it there. Okay. So just remember that you have that power. Like if you don't want to leave that rooster in that environment, you don't have to, even if you've made an agreement, you do not have to. So, um, I hope that's helpful to you. I know it's a, it's a genuine dilemma. It really is. The only thing I ask is that whatever you decide to do, make sure it's humane. Um, having worked with the Humane Society here where I live, there's so many abandoned roosters every year. and People dump them in the woods. And, um, you know, there are breeds of roosters that will do well in the wild. And there's a lot of breeds that won't. Um, and many of them, you're just kind of, sentencing them to, you know, be eaten by a predator. So, uh, just remember that and, um, whatever you decide to do, make sure it's humane. Okay. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Remember, if you want to submit a question, all you have to do is go to my website, welcome to chickenlandia.com and go to the contact section and you maybe could be chicken famous. I, I read all the questions guys. I read all of them. I do. I can't answer all of them. I get, I get so many, I can't answer all of them. It's certainly not in a timely matter, but I do try to read them and I do answer some of them. So um, definitely I'd love to hear from you. Okay guys, I am going to open up the chat for questions. If you have a question, type it in all caps so I can see it. <laughs> Otherwise I can't see it. I can, but it's just easier. Mm. Yep, chicken famous. <laughs> um, okay, so Susie Floozy asks a question. Uh, what about rooster collars? Are those awful? So I was just answering someone. Someone else just answered asked a question about those. Um, so, uh, no crow collars. They're, they're pretty controversial. Some people just absolutely think they're horribly cruel and some people have used them and they're quite pleased with them and they, you know, they're, they, they feel that their rooster has gotten used to them. I do have someone in my life that used one and she is like, uh, you know, a vegan and, <laughs> and loves animals and loves her loves her rooster. Um, but she does, she lives in a neighborhood. And so she made the decision, you know, I'm going to try this and see how he does. And, um, he doesn't see, he doesn't, he, you know, initially he didn't like it. And then, but then, you know, now he just wears it all the time and he doesn't seem to mind it. And what it does is it just keeps them from like extending their, like they have to, they have to take a certain stance in order to belt out that crow and, you know, uh, this certain movement in order to belt out that crow and it, it restricts it a little bit. It doesn't restrict it completely. They, they will still crow. That's the other thing is like many of them will still crow. It'll just be quieter. Now, as far as whether or not this is something that you should do, I think you need to look at your specific circumstance. Generally, I feel like it's better for a rooster to remain in his flock. 
um, you know, it's there's a lot of roosters out there, and a lot of them don't have homes, and a lot of them end up, um, you know, in in not great conditions, like we were just talking about. So if there's a way that you can keep them, and it's not too bothersome for them then you could try it, you know? Um, and I know some people won't like that I said that, uh, but looking at it from my position where I see so many roosters that are abandoned and, and killed and, you know, that experience cruelty and all that, I, I have to look at like what, what's the best case scenario for the most number of roosters. And I would say that there are cases where, you know, if it works, then I think it's okay to do it. Um, and then, but then there's other situations where it's very clear that the rooster is just absolutely miserable in this thing. And if that's the case, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't force it. And, um, you know, I would begin looking to see what your options are as far as rehoming that rooster. So that's my question for that. Don't come after me. <laughs> that's my answer for that. I mean. Hold on. Sorry. Uh, Benny Hime, what's the best treatment for mites? So I do have a video about that, um, like the best natural treatments. The ones that I think, the, the top three that I like are uh, good old diatomaceous earth, which I know is controversial too. <laughs> um, but I do like that and I have used that before um, as a preventative and as a treatment. Now there are two kinds of diatomaceous earth. Um, one is crystalline and one is um, amorphous. And you want amorphous diatomaceous earth and that would be food grade diatomaceous earth, not pool grade. Okay. You do not want like industrial grade diatomaceous earth. That's crystalline and it's not good. Okay. And that's where, um, diatomaceous earth gets this bad rap because that, because that is actually dangerous and it doesn't have any effect on the exoskeleton of insects. So <laughs> you wouldn't want to use it in your chicken yard. Um, so food grade diatomaceous earth, I would treat you know, the chickens themselves for diatomaceous and the coop, you have to clean out the coop, treat the whole coop, get it all into, you know, all the nooks and crannies. Um, and I also use it in their dust baths, but you know, for diatomaceous earth, I would do that three times, 10 days apart. Um, I think that that's better and you may even need to do it more than that, but, um, I would start there and that's been very helpful to me. Um, there's also, uh, pyrethroids. So, uh, permethrin is, it is synthetic, but it's, um, it's from chrysanthemums and it is, um, it's just like a, um, it's made to kind of last longer and remain, you know, just to have a, a little longer lasting effect. So it's not technically natural, but it's a more, it's a more benign, of the non-natural treatments. So um, I would just be careful using um, any pyrethroids because they're, it's really bad for cats. You do not want it around cats. Um, I would not inhale it. There's some thought that it uh, it's an endocrine disruptor. So that's not great either. <laughs> you know, like no, nothing is completely benign. Okay, so um, I would be careful to use it only when needed. Use it just on the chicken, in the coop, and you can do that um, twice, 10 days apart. Make sure you clean your coop out. Um, and then the other one is um, Elector PSP, which is a, a Spinosad. Is that how you pronounce it? Sp sp I, I, do, I always read it and I don't say it. Spinosad? Um, S-P-I-N. Oh, oh gosh, I can't spell right now. <laughs> <laughs> why did I try <laughs> um that is made from <laughs> I swear I know things I promise I'm not an idiot <laughs> um it's made from bacteria that's found naturally in the soil um and it's pretty it's one of the more benign ones it is crazy expensive it is so expensive, but it lasts a long time. So it might be like out of reach. Um, that's why I don't like, that's not my first recommendation because it's out of reach for so many people. 
but it is good. A lot of people really, really like it. And supposedly you only need to use it once. Like you only need to treat them once. But I, you know, I've heard conflicting things about that. So you might have to do it twice. Um, and it, it comes, it lasts a very long time because it comes in like a concentrated form and then you, you dilute it before you put it on the chickens and in the coop. But, um, yeah, that is, you know, all of these can be harmful to bees. So you definitely want to limit their use to only where and as needed. Um, they can all, I, I'm pretty sure they're probably all harmful to like aquatic life. So you just need to be careful. Um, and then, you know, make sure that they have somewhere to dust bathe all year round. Okay. So those are my best treatments for mites. And I do have a video about that. I can link that in the description and in the show notes for you. Uh, Diane asks, I am expecting eggs. My girl Ursula is squatting. Uh, how, and you know, when chickens, when they start, when they get near the time where they're going to start laying, you can tell because their comb and wattles, they get bigger and more pronounced and more red and their faces get more red. And then, you know, if you come up to them, they might squat because they think you're a rooster. <laughs> Awkward. Um, <laughs> but uh, and that's when you know that soon they're going to start laying. Okay, so um, she said, Diane says, how long will it be? She's 17 weeks and she's a barred rock. I'm going to say like within the week for a barred rock, I bet she starts laying very soon. Um, they, they, they're just such champion layers. That's, you know, it's really, it's like, um, 16 to 20 weeks so I bet she's about to start laying um, and sometimes there will be chickens that start even before 16 weeks and there's some chickens that start after um, and it also it depends on the season that you're in so if they come into the age where they're at the they should be at the point of lay but it like the the days are really short then they'll wait until the days get longer and then they'll start laying or if they come into lay when it's like really, really hot, they'll wait until it cools off. But you, generally, it's between 16 and 20 weeks. So I bet you are going to see your first egg very soon. Okay, guys, I'm answering one more question. Actually, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to answer two more questions. <laughs> Uh, and then we will stop. Okay. Uh, Sandy says, what should I use instead of wood ash for a dust bath? So the only like essential ingredient for a dust bath is dirt, dirt or sand. Okay. You don't have to put anything else in it other than that. It just needs to be dry. Like that's the main thing. Cause especially when it's like, you know, it's the fall or winter where they can't find there, you know, there's just not as many places where they can dust bathe because maybe it's wet outside or snowy outside or whatever. The main ingredient you want is dry dirt or sand. Okay. Um, if you, if you want to, you can add wood ash and you can add diatomaceous earth, but you don't have to. Okay. So, um, I don't know. I don't know if this makes sense, but like I'll put like four parts dirt and then like one part wood ash and one part diatomaceous earth. Um, or you could put two parts diatomaceous earth, you know, or you don't even have to measure. <laughs> but if I didn't have wood ash and I wanted to put something extra in there to just like make sure, you know, to just really have that added layer of protection against parasites, I would just put diatomaceous earth. And I think that would be fine. And you can put like herbs, you can put like lavender and um, lemon, lemon verbena and all, you know, these nice calming herbs so they can have like that nice bath. Um, so there's lots of things that you can do, but um, the main thing that you want is dry dirt or sand. Like that is what they need. That's the main ingredient, okay? 
Okay, last question from Bulletproof. How do you keep hawks away from your chickens? So unless you have a farm dog or other kind of working dog or just a great dog that hangs out, you know, a big dog that hangs out with your chickens um, or some other kind of uh, animal like a donkey or something like that that's out there with your chickens, really the only foolproof way of keeping aerial predators away from your flock is to cover your run, to keep them in an enclosed run. So, uh, you know, for me, I have them in a run and they, there's netting over the run and it's strong netting. It's like a industrial strength netting over the run. Um, some people will use uh, fisherman's netting. I, I used to have that. And down at the marina where I live, um, the fishermen would just throw out their old netting and the chicken keepers would come and get it. Like they would put it next to the the dumpster, <laughs> you know, at the marina because they knew the chicken people wanted to come and get it. So they would, you know, I, I came and I got some and it was re it's really strong netting and it, that will keep aerial predators away. But you've got to put something over their run to if you want to keep them out. And it, it needs to be like either roofing or netting or um, hardware mesh. You could put, uh, you could put chicken wire if, you know, over your run. If your chickens are in a predator proof coop at night. Because chicken wire is great for keeping chickens in but it's not great for keeping predators out. So it would keep the flying predators out, but it wouldn't keep like a raccoon out um, or anything that could climb up there and chew through it. So there's that to consider. But yeah, it's it's unfortunate. Like um, raptors are beautiful. We love them. Um, and they're super necessary. They're a, they're a really important part of our ecosystem but they love chickens. <laughs> they love to eat chicken. And really the only way is to cover your run, which can get pretty expensive. But, you know, sometimes people find used materials. Um, if you have a marina, if you live next to an area where there's fishing, uh, you know, that type of fishing going on, then maybe you'll be able to find something like that. But yeah, you got to cover the run. Got to keep them in a covered run if you, if you want to keep the aerial predators away and at bay. Okay, guys, thank you so much for all your questions. And, you know, thank you to everybody who submitted a question to Bok Talk. Um, and just thank you so much just for joining me today. Thank you to my moderator and co-producer. Her name is Kelsey Paulus. She's also known as the Chickenlandia Presidential Advisor. Thank you to Talking to Crows for editing this episode and to Double M Ranch for their wonderful podcast art. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to, if you're here watching on YouTube, you can give it a thumbs up. You can rate and review it if you are, you know, on your podcast app. That really, really helps me, you know, give me a, give me a nice review. That really, really helps me, you know, just to get this podcast out there and for people to hear it and see it. Um, it's very helpful to me. But the, the one thing that I want you guys to remember, no matter what, is that you are always welcome in Chickenlandia. <laughs> Bye, guys.